Well, thank you, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to the sixth plenary session connecting Indian Ocean and uh, Pacific uh, security. As veterans of the IISS Shangri-La Dialogue will know, over the last four or five years, we've tried uh, to integrate into the Shangri-La Dialogue a more important conversation about uh, small island states, both uh, in the Indian Ocean and uh, the Pacific Ocean. We don't, uh, this year on the panel, have a representative, strictly speaking, from the Indian Ocean, but happily we do have a number of delegates uh, here in the hall uh, from the Indian Ocean. So when we come to uh, question and answers, I shall uh, give uh, preferential access to the floor to those who are able to uh, represent uh, that other large ocean. And the IISS uh, having a, a long experience of looking at uh, great power politics and the hard questions of uh, nuclear deterrence and, and military weaponry uh, is also uh, very determined to understand the, the very specific uh, security concerns that uh, island states have that are not limited only to the iconic question of climate change, but to all sorts of other issues that I know our three panelists here will, in their own way, uh, address. And I will ask them to address us in the order that they appear on your digital agenda. We're delighted to have uh, first to speak in a moment, uh, Sutin Khunsang, the Minister of uh, Defense of uh, Thailand, uh, Thailand for uh, 20 years has been a, a consistent supporter of the IISS Shangri-La Dialogue, and I thank you, uh, Mr. Minister, for being with us uh, for this whole uh, weekend. I'm delighted also that we will have with us uh, Judith Collins, uh, King's Counsel, Minister of Defense of New Zealand, and as is often the case with New Zealand ministers carrying four or five other official uh, portfolios as well. Uh, she's a member of uh, the New Zealand Quad, uh, the Prime Minister, the Foreign Minister, the Defense Minister, and the Minister for Trade and Industry, who uh, are the four of them engaged in massive international travel to project uh, New Zealand's interests uh, around the world and to invite more people to take a return trip to New Zealand uh, from time to time. So I'm delighted that she's with us today. And of course, uh, Bill Blair, the Minister of National Defense of Canada, uh, a, a country that identifies as a Pacific nation, um, both in the literal and figurative sense uh, of the term. So we're delighted uh, to have you with us as well. So with that, prefatory remark, please could I invite Minister Stutin to take the floor. Thank you. So John Shipman, the Executive Chairman of the International Institute for Strategic Studies, Excellencies and Distinguished Delegates, I'm much delighted to be a part of the Shangri-La Dialogue this year. As I recognize that this has become the prominent strategic dialogue in the region. The participants have openly exchanged their perspectives and opinions, which will significantly contribute to fostering understanding and promoting security cooperation among us. I would like to express my gratitude and admiration towards the IISS and the Ministry of Defense of Singapore for continuously organizing the remarkably important forum. Especially, I am honored to have the opportunity to share my perspectives regarding connecting Indian Ocean and Pacific security. When referring to the Indian Ocean, I think of a vast maritime area stretching from the eastern coast of Africa to the Southeast Asia Peninsula, reaching the western coast of Australia. It is an area rich in natural resources, as well as the birthplaces of numerous monumental ancient civilization of mankind, Moreover, it has been a vital maritime route since ancient times, continuing to be so today. More than one-third of global maritime trade 
and significantly more than two-thirds of oil and natural gas shipments pass through the Indian Ocean. As Thailand is located on a peninsula in Southeast Asia, connecting to both the Indian Ocean and the Pacific Ocean, it has been a hub of prosperity and cultural amalgamation from the Eastern and Western civilizations. This region has historically been referred to as Suvannapum, or the land of gold, characterized by its geopolitical connection and its role as a cultural crossroads bridging the world as well as being historically important trading posts, demonstrating that connectivity has been the key factor in fostering prosperity and wealth from the past to present. I do very much realize that every country has its own strategy to promote connectivity. While there may be variation in implementation and approaches, I believe that we all share the same goal of fostering trade and people-to-people -people interactions which are fundamental factors for the shared prosperity of the region. Strategies and mechanisms of regional cooperation include initiatives such as Belt and Road Initiative, the Indo-Pacific Economic Framework, Regional Comprehensive Economic Partnership, as well as collaboration within the APEC Framework. In this regard, Thailand is pleased to promote co co cooperation with all countries through various mechanisms to enhance connectivity and mutual prosperity on both sides of the ocean. The increasing connectivity, on one hand, will present the opportunities for economic prosperity, societal benefits, and collective human security development. However, on the other hand, it also posed challenges to regional security, ranging from intensified geopolitical competition to the emerging trans-border security challenges, such as transnational crime, illegal migration, piracy, and environmental degradation issues. Therefore, enhancing cooperation among countries in the region is a vital mechanism to foster trust and confidence building, as well as to enhance collective efforts in addressing regional security challenges in order to ensure safe and seamless connectivity in all dimensions. In this regard, Thailand is pleased to act as a mediator and is ready to be a valuable collaborator with all parties in order to cultivate a friendly atmosphere in the region rather than conflicts or tensions. We also aim to promote and support the cooperative mechanisms in border management to respond to the borderless, non-traditional security threats. Furthermore, I reaffirm our support of regional multilateral cooperation, particularly through the ASEAN-led mechanisms, and aspire to promote genuine cooperation based on mutual trust, mutual respect, and mutual benefits, as well as openness, transparency, and inclusiveness from all parties. These principles are reflected in the ASEAN outlook on the Indo-Pacific. I do also support coordination and collaboration between the ASEAN-led mechanisms with regional and sub-regional cooperation frameworks, such as Indian Ocean Rim Association, Bay of Bengal Initiative for Multi-Sectoral 
technical and economic cooperation, and macro cooperation framework, as well as other mechanisms in the Pacific region, including Pacific Island Forum, to strengthen relationships and to promote a more coordinated, integrated, and interconnected cooperative efforts. In order to promote connectivity, the safety of maritime domain is crucial in this regard. To address maritime security challenges, Thailand firmly supports regional cooperation, particularly in enhancing maritime domain awareness through the promotion of maritime information sharing and collaboration, which is not only focusing on military and traditional security aspects, but also on other dimensions, such as maritime search and rescue humanitarian assistance and disaster relief. Climate change and maritime environmental issues, including illegal, unreported, and unregulated fishing, or IUU. Besides, I would like to take this opportunity to commend the Ministry of Defense of Singapore for the initiation and establishment of the Maritime Information Fusion Center, which carries on its duty effectively in collecting and sharing of maritime information that helps create a comprehensive regional maritime situation picture, as well as promptly facilitates coordinated responses to maritime threats. Thailand emphasizes regional maritime cooperation by actively participating in various key cooperative mechanisms, such as the RECAP, the Strait of Malacca Sea and Air Patrols, the ASEAN Naval Shift Meeting, the ADMM Plus Expert Working Group on Maritime Security, the Western Pacific Naval Symposium, and Indian Ocean Naval Symposium, which the Royal Thai Navy has an opportunity to share the meeting during the year 2023 to 2025, highlighting the blue economy that will support effective and sustainable use of marine resources and efficient and beneficial shared maritime domains management. Additionally, the Ministry of Defense of Thailand is pleased to co-share with the U.S. Department of Defense, the ADMM Plus Expert Working Group on Maritime Security between 21 to 2024. The key outcome is the initiative of the Maritime Security Roadmap 2040, which is the long-term cooperation framework that aims to promote continuity, consistency, and practical activities at all levels, including a work plan focusing on climate change and protection of the marine environment. And we look forward to supporting Republic of the Philippines and Japan to further develop practical cooperation under the roadmap. Distinguished delegates, when we talk about security challenges, it is not limited only to the military dimension. It also encompasses other dimensions, including human security, especially economic security, food security, and public health. These are fundamental factors in sustaining people's livelihoods. As for Thailand, the Royal Thai Armed Forces has been taxed not only in defending the country in the traditional sense, but also plays a crucial role in promoting and supporting national development by utilizing its capabilities and resources to promote economic development and the elevation of the people's living standard. These efforts are carried out on people-oriented and people-centered basis, aiming to strengthen the national resilience and move towards the goal of comprehensive security and sustainable development. Therefore, the Ministry of Defense must utilize the allocated budget 
to develop the armed forces to be modern, versatile, and capable of performing a variety of tasks. We also aim to review our force structure to be more compact, agile, and self-sufficient being able to cope with the current security challenges of the 21st century, as well as in supporting other government agencies and private sectors to address vital national security issues, particularly transboundary security challenges and cyber security. This also includes assisting the people in times of distress and participating in national development to enhance the livelihood of the people. Distinguished guests, over the past decades, we have witnessed an increase in military expenditures across all regions, which has been perceived as a factor impacting global and regional security stability. However, I would argue that increasing military spending and modernization efforts are not solely the main causes of instability. Instead, in my belief, lack of continued communication and confidence building are the main factors, potentially leading to misunderstandings and miscalculations. Under the current circumstances of intense strategic competition, it is essential for us all to find commonalities to work together and play a constructive role in collectively addressing global pressing security issues, as well as creating shared public goods and prosperity. Last and very importantly, to punctuate all that I have mentioned, the promotion of connectivity between the Indian Ocean and the Pacific Ocean presents opportunities for shared prosperity and sustainable development in the region. However, on the contrary, there are also rising challenges that we must consider and find more collaboration to address. Maintaining regional security and stability is not something that can be achieved easily and quickly. Therefore, I call upon all countries for our highest level of commitment on continual close cooperation and moving forward together constructively. These efforts to be based upon mutual trust, mutual respect, and mutual benefit which would lead to the attainment of regional peace, security, stability, and shared prosperity. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Minister, and in particular for noting the uh, importance of the Maritime Fusion Center. We might in discussion want to uh, address the question of whether uh, the information that is gathered in the Maritime Fusion Center can also help uh, with policing issues like unregulated fishing and energy disputes in the area. So let's hold that uh, for the Q&A. But with that, could I invite Judith Collins to take the floor and give New Zealand's perspective on uh, this issue. Well, good morning, everybody, and as we say in New Zealand, kia ora. Thank you to the International Institute of Strategic Studies for the invitation to speak on this panel today and for your ongoing work organising the Shangri-La Dialogue. And it's great to be here today alongside my Thai and Canadian colleagues to discuss security connections across the wider Indo-Pacific. I'm so proud to be New Zealand's Minister of Defence, a role that brings me here today and among other roles, I am the minister responsible for New Zealand's intelligence agencies, the Minister for Space, and the Minister for Science, Innovation, and Technology. And over the past several months, I, it, these have re, it has reinforced to me the connections across these portfolios, particularly in terms of the need for responses to security challenges that integrate multiple tools of statecraft. Similarly, the security challenges we face today across the Indo-Pacific, while distinct in many ways, are also strongly connected. We may be a small state, relatively distant from the world geographically, but our people, culture, history, values and interests connect us to our immediate Pacific region, to the wider Indo-Pacific and to the world at large. We know that our security and prosperity is connected 
to broader regional and global security and prosperity. The New Zealand government is determined to bring increased energy to our international engagements and activities to support collective security efforts. And I am focused on ensuring that New Zealand is an active and constructive partner and that the New Zealand Defence Force has the right capabilities to operate effectively on the international stage. New Zealand maintains long-standing contributions to a number of multinational peacekeeping operations, notably in the Middle East and on the Korean Peninsula. And on the latter, I'm pleased to report that our new P-8A Poseidon aircraft has just completed its first mission, contributing to monitoring evasion of United Nations sanctions by North Korea. This is a continuation of our participation in this program since 2018 in opposition to North Korea's illegal nuclear and ballistic mis missile programs, which constitute a serious threat to stability in the Indo-Pacific. And we have responded alongside others to security developments that threaten our shared interests. In addition to supporting Ukraine to defend itself against Russia's illegal invasion, we have contributed personnel to the multinational operations protecting maritime trade against Houthi attacks in the Red Sea. At the same time, we have continued a regular program of engagements, exercises and operations in Asia, and with particular focus on supporting maritime security. For example, HMNZS Aotearoa will take advantage of the journey back from the upcoming Rim of the Pacific exercise to undertake a program of activities in Asia. While these operations address distinct security issues, I see connections between them. The South Pacific is and always will be a focus for New Zealand. New Zealand is a Pacific nation, and our security is directly connected to that of our Pacific partners and of the region as a whole. New Zealand works with our Pacific partners and partners from outside the region to protect and promote Pacific security interests. And at the centre of that region and at the heart of region's setting of the security agenda is the Pacific Island Forum Leaders Meeting. As for many other global regions, the Pacific has its own character and distinctiveness, its own history and cultures, and its own security challenges and opportunities. And through the Pacific Island Forum, leaders Bowie Declaration, Pacific Island countries identified climate change as the region's primary security challenge. The Pacific countries are not responsible for the causes of climate change, but are acutely facing its effects, which are placing greater demands on countries' resilience and security capabilities. Global action to address climate change is crucial for the Pacific and is also the case for vulnerable states elsewhere in the Indo-Pacific region. Similarly, the Pacific is now increasingly important as a theatre for strategic competition. And this raises the prospect of actors that do not share Pacific interests and values acting in ways that undermine regional security. Rather than seeing themselves as isolated small island states, Pacific countries are increasingly presenting themselves as large ocean states, connected by the blue Pacific continent. Using this frame, the importance of maritime security for the Pacific is clear. We are seeing increasing threats to Pacific fisheries, particularly from illegal, unregulated and unreported fishing alongside increasing instances of transnational organised crime. And perhaps most acutely in the South China Sea, we are seeing conflicting states' ambitions resulting in challenges to maritime sovereignty. These maritime security challenges lead to an erosion of international maritime rules and norms that would have significant implications for states across the Indo-Pacific including in New Zealand's own Pacific region. So how we respond to these security challenges will affect us all. 
I see two connected forms of response. First is security cooperation on particular issues between groups of states that share interests. The second is to support for the international rules-based system. New Zealand has long participated in various collective security arrangements that have varying degrees of formality. We see such arrangements as key mechanisms for states to prosecute their shared interests in ways that can be complementary and mutually reinforcing and can strengthen regional and global security as a whole. Here in Southeast Asia, ASEAN provides a central venue for regional states and partners to discuss shared security challenges and a set of mechanisms for cooperation on distinct issues. For New Zealand, we particularly see value in the ADMM Plus and its expert working groups. But we also recognise that building individual relationships with key partners in Southeast Asia is more critical than ever. Whether it is recognising the ongoing importance of the five power defence arrangements, that includes Singapore and Malaysia, or through investigating new arrangements that support defence policy, dialogues and exercises, New Zealand can make a meaningful contribution. With Australia, Japan and Korea, we are now engaging more closely with NATO. Not because NATO seeks a role in the Indo-Pacific, as indeed the NATO partners have made very clear, but to discuss and cooperate on security issues that affect our shared interests. New Zealand also welcomes AUKUS as an initiative to enhance regional security and stability. Pillar 2 involves cooperation between some of our closest security partners on advanced non-nuclear technologies, including areas in which we already work closely together with our only ally, Australia, the US and the UK. New Zealand is investigating opportunities for our potential involvement in AUKUS Pillar 2, but any decisions about participation would be a matter of, for our government's cabinet and for the existing partners in due course. Our commitment to cooperation on particular issues where we have shared interests is also why New Zealand is pleased to endorse the statement of principles to strengthen the region's defence industrial base. And of course, we are working with a range of countries to respond to emerging security issues as we are doing in relation to Ukraine and the Red Sea. Outside of a strictly security lane, we are also continuing to work with a range of countries on international agreements that will have security benefits. And here I would use as an example the Indo-Pacific Economic Framework for Prosperity. New Zealand also sees value in and supports multinational security arrangements in which we are not directly involved. The Indo-Pacific Quad involving India, Japan, Australia and the United States is a good example of states working together to support security in ways that align with New Zealand's own interests and values. While this won't be a particularly novel suggestion, I consider that these types of international arrangements are a key way for states to cooperate to support their shared security interests, both for the benefits of these arrangements directly provide, but also because, as a collective, these arrangements provide networks of cooperation that can connect states and regions as a whole to each other. Extending and expanding multinational security cooperation arrangements takes us naturally to the system of international rules and norms that benefits us all. This is the international rules-based system based in and around the United Nations and its principles. Ultimately, all states benefit from strong international rules and norms, and all states must ensure they are acting in ways that support those rules and norms. For the Indo-Pacific, and using maritime security as an example, we can see how the international rules-based system provides mechanisms for addressing and connecting security across the wider region. 
ultimately security of maritime trade through the Red Sea, preventing weapons proliferation counter to United Nations direction, freedom of navigation in key Indo-Pacific regions, including the South China Sea, and in New Zealand's immediate region, as well as management of Pacific fisheries, all rely on a strong international rules-based system. I won't be alone in recognising that today we all face an increasingly challenging strategic environment, and particularly here in the Indo-Pacific. In New Zealand, we recognise that our security and prosperity is connected to and dependent on wider regional and global security and prosperity. We will be increasing the energy we bring to our international security partnerships to support our strong interests in wider regional security and the strength of the international rules-based system. Thank you for your time today. Thank you very much for drawing together so elegantly the very, uh, very distinct threads uh, of your assessment of the security in the region, and I think we should uh, uh, remind ourselves of that strategic personality of the small island states as large ocean states um, uh, as we um, carry the conversation forward. And I, I hope we'll have a chance to discuss whether the, the Pacific Island Forum uh, is content with the type of relationships it directly has with the, the COP process and how they're working towards COP29. So we wouldn't want to lose that important point. With that, could I invite the Defence Minister of Canada to address this plenary? Thank you very much, Bill. Thank you very much, Sir John. Distinguished delegates, my panel, panel, panel members, good morning. Bonjour tout le monde. Uh, it is a great pleasure and an honor to be here at the 21st Shangri-La Dialogue as Canada's Minister of National Defence. This is my first trip to the Shangri-La Dialogue, but I have been extraordinarily impressed uh, by, the, by this gathering and its importance in, of collaboration, its an emphasis on the importance of collaboration and communication as we all work together to uphold peace and security in the two oceans that connect this vast and vital region. I want to take the opportunity as well to thank the ISSS and Singapore for, for hosting this important dialogue. It has actually, for me personally, changed perceptions in a very material and important way, and I'm very grateful for the experience. As Sir John indicated, I am very pleased to be able to say that Canada is a proud Pacific nation. My country has a Pacific coastline stretching some 25,000 kilometers. And as a Pacific nation, Canada's future and prosperity is deeply tied to the stability and security of the entire Indo-Pacific region. It is the fastest growing region by economy and by population. And it is Canada's second largest regional export market and trading partner. The ties between our peoples are strong. Nearly one-fifth of all Canadians have family origins that began here in the Indo-Pacific. And Canada's role as a Pacific nation is part of who we are as a country. And for that reason, a free, open, and inclusive Indo-Pacific is vital to our nation's future as well. We recognized a few years ago that we needed to be more present in this part of the world. It's one of the reasons we released Canada's Indo-Pacific strategy back in 2022. That strategy is investing some two and a half billion dollars to increase our presence in the region, including over half a billion dollars to increase our security and defense ties. This investment allows us to increase our naval presence from two to three frigates deployed each year. It has enabled us to increase our participation in joint exercises in a new military capacity building program. And we are being enabled to engage with regional partners in order to bolster cyber capabilities to address issues of disaster risk reduction, emergency relief, and humanitarian assistance. Our partners and allies have told us that they need to see a more reliable and consistent partner. I want to assure you all that Canada is making the necessary investments, not only to be more present here, but to be an engaged and contributing partner to all of the very important initiatives that we have spoken about throughout this dialogue. Our presence here in the Indo-Pacific runs deep. We have benefited tremendously from long-standing engagements with the military in the region, and these relationships, as I have come to learn, are the strength of our ties. Since the Korean War, our military has maintained a continuous presence in the United Nations Command in South Korea, 
where today a very proud Canadian, Lieutenant, Lieutenant General Derek McCauley serves as its deputy commander. And through Operation Neon, we deploy aircraft and ships to monitor UN Security Council uh, sanctions ev evasion by North Korea, and we are present in the region today. For decades, we've been sharing expertise with our regional partners, particularly in Southeast Asia through our military training and cooperation program. And we want to do even more with partners in the region. Today, for example, I'm very pleased to confirm that Canada will join the new initiative on defense industrial base resilience in the Indo-Pacific that was announced earlier in this conference by Secretary of Defense Lloyd Austin. I would be remiss if I didn't take the opportunity to commend Secretary Austin for his extraordinary leadership in every theater of the world. This initiative is going to strengthen our collective security, and it's going to ensure that Canada, the United States, and all of our partners can harness innovation and reduce barriers to cooperation. It's going to help us build a more secure Indo-Pacific region and support our domestic defense industries. Now, if I may return to the theme of this panel, Canada is a trading nation, and our economy relies on a free, open, and inclusive Indo-Pacific. That's why, through our Indo-Pacific strategy, we are increasing our naval deployments in the region. We've long deployed warships from our west coast to the region, but, but most recently, through our Indo-Pacific strategy, we have announced that we are also beginning to deploy our ships from the Atlantic Ocean through the Red Sea, the Gulf of Aden, and the Indian Ocean. And as these warships sail through the Indian Ocean on their way to the Pacific, and as a matter of fact, Her Majesty's Canadian ship Montreal is currently making that passage. And at this moment, that ship and its crew are conducting a port visit at Port Klang in Malaysia, just up the coast. And in the coming days, that ship, with its Canadian sailors, will transit through the Strait of Malacca and onward towards the Pacific. The reason we deploy these ships is to support the rules-based international order in the region, because we believe that all of our ships must be able to travel freely, and in trade routes in both the Indian Ocean and the Pacific Ocean, must always be free and open for all to sail, according to our international rules. We must keep these two great oceans secure and connected by respecting the rules that govern conduct between nations. And, the, and Montreal is not, the, is not the first, it is the first, but only the, the first of three, excuse me, Canadian frigates that will be in the region. And today I'm also pleased to announce that this week, the, the Canadian ship Vancouver will be departing for our, from our Pacific coast to train later this month along the naval forces of 28 other countries through RIMPAC. We'll be deploying a supply ship a Asterix, our new Ar Arctic and offshore patrol vessels, Max Bernays, and sending nearly 300 Canadian Armed Forces members in, into the region. And following these military exercises in Hawaii, Vancouver will then sail westward to, to perform its duties in the Indo-Pacific. I'm very proud to also share with you that Royal Canadian Navy Commodore Christian Monaghan will be commanding RIMPAC's entire maritime component this year, and I hope that for us that is a testament to Canada's commitment to leadership as we engage with all of our partners in the Indo-Pacific. In short, our Indo-Pacific strategy is intended to deliver results. We're conducting more port visits in Europe countries. We're participating more in multinational training exercises with your militaries. We're also expanding our military capacity and building upon efforts, offering training programs that improve interoperability. And I think perhaps most importantly, given the very understandable concerns that, that the region has expressed with respect to climate change and climate-related emergencies and disasters, we believe there's great opportunity to continue to invest in humanitarian assistance, disaster reef, risk reduction, and emergency response. Now, nearly two months ago, our Prime Minister and I launched Canada's new defense policy in which we've entitled it, Our North, Strong and Free. This policy takes note of some very significant sh geopolitical shifts that we are all facing, including the fact that our Arctic is becoming far more accessible as a result of climate change. And we anticipate that perhaps by 2050, the fastest shipping route between Europe and Asia will be through our Arctic. It takes note in our document of, Canada, of Russia's illegal and unprovoked war of aggression against Ukraine. I want to take this opportunity as well to assure both President Zelensky and Defense Minister Umarov that Canada will always stand with Ukraine until its victory. Our commitment to Ukraine is unwavering and unyielding, and that is why our Prime Minister will also reiterate that position at the upcoming Ukraine Peace Summit taking place in Switzerland in, on June 14th. But in addition to the, the Euro-Atlantic, our defense policy identifies the Indo-Pacific as one of the two priority regions for military presence for the very first time. 
Our presence in the region is, is critical. That's why our policy is going to be investing over $10 billion to sustain our naval fleets so that we can continue to, to deploy our ships into the region on a regular basis and be that reliable and dependable partner that our allies and friends have asked for. And this policy is very clear about the challenges we are facing. We know, for example, that some countries have been pursuing their own interests through behaviors that challenge existing laws and norms. And we believe that these actions contribute to rising instability and in increased risk of miscalculation and error. It therefore falls to each of our countries to work together to uphold the global rules that have delivered peace and prosperity for billions of people in this region and around the world. And we stand ready to engage with China, for example, and with all of our partners throughout the Indo-Pacific to ensure a secure and stable region. I think the most important element of that engagement is strong communication between our defense institutions, and it is vital. That, and to that end, I had the opportunity through this dialogue to engage with China's Defense Minister, Admiral Dong Jun. This was an important and welcome step. It has been over 11 years since Canada's Minister of National Defense sat at the table and had a discussion with their, their Chinese counterpart. It, is, it was long overdue. I can share with you some of the things that I expressed to the minister. I expressed our concern about China's recent military exercises around Taiwan and the, the potential provocation that that could result in. I also expressed concern about the growing economic support that China is supplying to Russia. And that is a concern to Canada and all of our allies who stand united with Ukraine in its defense of the illegal invasion of its sovereign territory. I shared with him that we expect all countries in this region to behave responsibly and to respect the international rules that keep us safe. It was a frank discussion, but it was an important discussion. And we also found common ground an interest in ensuring that together we work on disaster risk reduction, an appropriate response to emergencies throughout the region and around the world. I am very hopeful that that dialogue will continue. Let me conclude by reiterating that Canada is very eager to increase its cooperation with regional partners in both of the great oceans that we are here to discuss this morning. We know that we've got work to do to earn our place at that table. I want to assure you all we are prepared to do that work. We welcome opportunities to strengthen our defense relationship with each of your countries. We are committed to increasing our presence and our engagement so that you will not only see more of us, but we will build stronger relationships together. Our ties to the Indo-Pacific, as I've said, have run deep, and those ties are only growing to deliver a secure, prosperous future for all of our peoples. Let us work together to ensure free, open, and inclusive Indo-Pacific where rules and norms prevail. I look forward to continuing in this dialogue with all of you, and I want to once again thank the IISS for convening this important conversation. Thank you. Merci. Merci beaucoup, Monsieur le Ministre. Um, thank you very much. My goodness, it is quite something to hear that it's been 11 years since the Canadian Defence Minister had a face-to-face -face meeting with the Chinese Defense Minister, but we are proud that we provided that opportunity today. You ended your remarks, as did Judith Collins, by noting that there are threats to this region, and perhaps during the conversation we're about to have, we can be a bit more specific about issues like unregulated fishing, cyber, threats to undersea infrastructure, perhaps even the occasional interference in the internal affairs of some of the small island states, but large ocean states uh, that are resident here. So with that, I'm going to turn uh, to uh, our participants and maybe have six or seven interventions and then come back to the panel uh, for your uh, thoughts. And there might be some questions that are uh, specific uh, to uh, a few of the countries here. I'll go first to Aaron Connolly, please. Thank you, Sir John. Minister Sutin, I wanted to ask you about the conflict in Myanmar and specifically the number of scam centers that have grown up uh, in the border areas with Thailand in Myanmar, some of which are connected to the Thai electricity grid or data networks. Uh, and of course, Thais are also victims of these scam networks, as are many other citizens of the countries of this region. Uh, could you help us understand more about 
your efforts to combat these scam centers uh, through the Royal Thai Army's uh, uh, diplomacy with uh, non-state armed groups in Myanmar. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, and from Malaysia, Benedict Wilson now. Good morning and sawadika. Um, I have two questions here, uh, Minister Sutin. First of all, as a non-claimant state of the South China Sea, uh, how does Thailand see its role, whether through the ASEAN mechanism or the ADMM Plus, or even other mechanisms uh, on the territorial disputes that is happening now in the South China Sea? So what is Thailand's role as a non-claimant state? Uh, and I have a second question for Minister Collins. Uh, I really echo your support for the international rules-based system, but yesterday, uh, the Deputy Prime Minister of Australia did actually bring out that there are imperfections with this uh, rules-based system. From New Zealand's perspective, do you think that reforms can be done to promote a more just and equitable international order, especially as we evolve from a unipolar towards a multipolar world? If yes, what are these reforms? Thank you. From the UK, Nicholas Childs. Thank you, John. Um, I have a question on AUKUS uh, for Ministers Collins and Blair. Um, uh, Minister <laughs> Collins, you uh, referenced uh, AUKUS uh, and, uh, and the possible uh, participation or cooperation with AUKUS partners in the context of Pillar 2. I was wondering, although this, these are tentative discussions, um, uh, whether you have any particular areas of interest as far as technology uh, cooperation are, are concerned and what you think uh, New Zealand might bring to the uh, AUKUS partnership. And likewise to, um, to, to Minister Blair, um, uh, the extent to which uh, you have been considering and discussing uh, possible AUKUS, AUKUS collaboration uh, and, and how for both of you uh, AUKUS fits into your, the priorities you've expressed as far as collaboration uh, and connecting the Indian Ocean and Pacific security issues. Thank you. Thank you very much. I, I didn't think it important to note that 40% of the five eyes are represented here uh, on this panel, but it's also the two five eyes that aren't part of AUKUS. So uh, I'm very grateful for uh, that question. From Cambodia, Mangut Ki. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I think it is, um, this question is for the New Zealand minister. And I think it is clear that climate change is the primary challenges to the Pacific island. However, building climate change adaptability and resilience require tremendous resources. And recently, there, ha there has been some cases where China tried to provide and engage with those countries the resource that they need. So how does New Zealand government um, view in this regard? Thank you. Thank you. And from the US, Morgan Michaels. Thank you, Sir John. Uh, my question is for Minister Sutton. The conflict in Myanmar is the most severe humanitarian crisis uh, in the region, and as Myanmar's immediate neighbor, Thailand, has borne significant costs. Uh, in addition to the armed violence, the military's recent conscription law has driven hundreds of thousands of Myanmar civilians to seek shelter or work opportunities in Thailand estimates uh, range, but there could be more than 4 million Myanmar people in total living in Thailand. So my question is, how does Thailand plan to manage uh, the increasing flows of people from Myanmar into its territory? Thank you. And from Australia, Stephen Forshaw. Uh, thank, thank you, Sir John. Um, I have a question for all three of the ministers, if I may. Uh, all of your countries have quite an interesting space industry and capability, and I'm interested to understand how you see that industry playing a role in your um, Indian and Pacific Ocean strategy, given the huge uh, area of, uh, of water and, uh, and the islands in those territories. Do you see that space will provide an opportunity to integrate your security strategy with your industry base at home? Uh, and finally, in this round, uh, um, before I come back to the panel, I hope to get another round in from Thailand, uh, Sua Chani. All right, thank you. Um, my question is to Minister Sutin. Thank you for your speech outlining Thailand's achievement and commitment to regional and international security. While some security issues are shared across the region, some can be quite country specific. So my question to you is, how has Thailand been managing its own security issues, 
particularly the overlapping claim area dispute with Cambodia, which have been in stalemate for the past um, 20 years or so. Thank you. Excellent. Thank you very much. So with that, I think I'll have the panel answer the questions that were addressed specifically to them in this same order that they originally spoke, uh, and you got uh, uh, one or two more questions than the others. So if, if, if you could begin, sir, please, and then we'll go to Judith and Bill. Thank you. Thank you for all the questions. I would like to answer the question on Myanmar's situation. As you might very well aware that as an immediate neighbor with a shared border over 2,400 kilometers, therefore, peace in Myanmar greatly affects peace and stability in Thailand, especially between the people along the border. Whatever happened in Myanmar also most affected on the peace along the border. Therefore, Thailand closely monitor on the situation in Myanmar. We consider this is our responsibility. What we have done, we do adhere on the five-point consensus of ASEAN, which is an essential driver to address the situation in Myanmar. But what we need to be aware of is to involve in their internal affairs. This is what we concern. It is their internal affairs, but it is our responsibility is to assist and provide humanitarian assistance. There is a several numbers of Myanmar persons fleeing unrest across into Thailand. And we have provided humanitarian assistance and also allow them to stay in hum humanitarian areas along the border and provided basic needs, including medical treatment for these people. And when they are ready, they will go back to their countries. There is a very large number of people fleeing under situation for almost 50,000. 50,000 Myanmar people crossing the border of Thailand. We never push them back to the danger. We have estimated and provide humanitarian assistance with the very good cooperation from many countries. But there are a lot of factors, as you have mentioned, on the scam across the border and illegal migration that has caused some problems to the authority to handle. And more importantly, the problems affect from the communication, which Thailand, we have tried our best to resolve the situation on the scam along the border. The Royal Thai Armed Forces has the mechanism to closely monitor. And it is quite effective cooperation with Myanmar in solving this problem. But we still need time to solve this problem and use strong legal structure. Next is the problem on Southeast Asia. A South, a South, South China Sea issue, Thailand's position has been consistent. As a non claiming state, but as a user state, we are fully aware of the freedom of navigation and overflight. We do aware of the tension in South China Sea. 
but we have a consistent position that we urge all parties concerned to use maximum restraint and avoid provocation. And we also we also encourage the code of conduct in South China Sea. And we will continue to support every step of implement implementation of the code of conduct. We do hope that all parties concerned should aware of our concern on the issue in South China Sea and should return to implement and aware of the code of conduct. This will lead to the sustainable solution. Thank you. Thank you. Right, so there's several questions there, and I will do my best to amalgamate them. Um, the first question was around the rules-based order and basically do they need updating. Well, it would be really nice if people just sometimes stuck to the rules. That would be good. Um, rather than worrying about updating them. I really do feel that you know, we're part of a small advanced economy. Um, we're part of the multilateral approach to uh, rules and the way in which we conduct ourselves and our, our areas, our territories, our economic zones. And I do believe that they are uh, today the best that we have. And unless there's some a particular reason that we should change them, that we should leave them as they are until we have something better. Um, but the main thing is, if you've got the rules, follow them. Um, we, you've asked what, uh, there's a question about AUKUS and what could we bring. Well, it's pillar two, so it's uh, the technology side. We have uh, a significant technology sector and advanced as well as space. In fact, recently when I was in the UK, I, I came across some of our New Zealand uh, businesses, technology businesses, working very closely with the Ministry of Defence. So clearly somebody thinks there's something that, that we could add. And, um, and I think they're doing very well with their advanced technology. So we do have a, a history of using technology to become an agricultural and horticultural giant. Um, I'm sure we can use technology to become a really good contributor in security as well. When you ask about the question about climate change for the Pacific, and the question was something around uh, that China's been trying to assist and uh, what else could be done, I think one of the best things that all nations could do in the Pacific, for the Pacific, is to treat the Pacific nations as peers. Uh, Pacific nations are not playthings for larger countries, including New Zealand. It's really important that we understand that every person in the Pacific, like everyone here in Southeast Asia and Singapore, has the right to self-determination and need to be treated with respect. So one of the best things that any nation could do when they're helping, wanting to help the Pacific with their climate change issues, which of course are not, not um, their fault at all, is to think about, to ask them what would be helpful to them, and therefore also whether or not they can afford it, and if not, what is the deal, and being upfront about it. There's no point having Pacific nations deeply in debt and no, with no way of repaying it. That is simply not respectful that is actually not helpful to the Pacific. So issues around, obviously, resilience in terms of education, in terms of climate. But the other way that many nations could help the Pacific is to be respectful of their fishing rights. And as we hear always with the Pacific, the number one issue that comes up in defence in the Pacific is around illegal, unregulated fishing. And these Pacific nations, they often require assistance with monitoring that fishing, those fishing, um, illegal fishing, and make, taking some action. And that's something where New Zealand can help out, and we do. 
And part of that is using uh, satellite technology, also uh, naval and uh, other ships, but also it's about actually asking them what it is they need, treating them with respect, and understanding that um, might is not right. The other issue was around um, space. So yes, well, New Zealand does have a space industry. Thank you very much for noting it. I thought that was an Australian accent too, asking it. Excellent. Um, last year, we had the fourth most successful launches in the world after the US, China, and Russia. And our industry at the moment is entirely uh, commercial. Uh, our industry is also wishing to grow further in the advanced aviation space, and that is uh, where we're moving to, as well as the vertical liftoffs. So, yes, we do have something to add. We do have abilities, being at that part of the world, with no close neighbours, no neighbours to check with, nobody worrying about what we're doing, and we just get on with it. So I am very proud of our space industry and very proud to be its minister. Thank you very much. Might I just um, press you on, on one other thing? Uh, you mentioned the Maritime uh, Fusion Centre, and just now in your response you said something about the importance of understanding what is going on on the surface of the sea with unregulated fishing and other activities. Do we know what's going on underneath the sea? I think some of us do. And what are the problems there? Well, I don't know that I can say, but I certainly probably do. <laughs> with other roles. I mean, all joking aside, uh, we know that there's things going on. So there's obviously um, certain amounts of, of deep sea mining and other issues there. Those are for countries to take their own views on. But to be very frank, we have to be, make sure that Pacific nations um, are not going to be uh, pillaged, basically, of their resources by countries who can do so uh, without the Pacific nations being able to do much about it. Thank you. So in other words, just treat them with respect. <laughs> thank you very much. Bill. Yeah. Uh, th thank you, Sir John. Um, just with, with respect to the questions asked, first of all, if I may deal quickly with AUKUS, um, when the AUKUS members, and we're, we have a very close, both Judith and I share a very close relationship with our Five Eyes partners. It's, it's, it's been a longstanding and important collaboration. But they were exchanging information on nuclear submarines and the technology requ uh, required to drive them. Um, neither New Zealand nor Canada were in the business of, of looking for nuclear submarines. I'm actually in the process right now, Sir John, of I have to replace my submarine fleet. It's an aging Victoria-class submarine fleet, and I've got, to, I've got to go out and acquire 8 to 12 new submarines. But I'm looking at the conventional model. Um, but we also, with respect to AUKUS, we've had, I've had a number of really useful conversations with our, with our allies. And they're developing a framework. The AUKUS members are developing a framework so that on a case-by-case, -case, project by project basis, they're quite willing to engage with others on, on the technology aspects. We've had a number of discussions. I think Canada has a great deal to contribute to that uh, second pillar in areas around artificial intelligence, quantum physics, sensors, and other deep technologies. Um, we, we believe that they're, they're, we're well on a path towards developing um, that arrangement so that we can contribute. And we think it would be also beneficial to us. Not that we, we have, I believe we have something strong to contribute, but we also have something strong to gain from that because we all have a responsibility to be able to work together. And in particular, you talked about, uh, do we know what's going on under the, under the sea, underwater surveillance um, in all regions of the world, certainly in the Pacific, which for us will be a significant priority. It's going to be important that we be able to work closely and collaboratively um, and, and to be able to exchange and, and data and other information with, with our closest allies. And so uh, we, we, I'm very confident that um, as our allies develop that framework for cooperation on the second pillar, Canada will be part of that. And with respect to the question around space, you know, I think traditionally all of our militaries have looked at the three th theaters of potential conflict, in maritime, air, and on land. But there are two other very significant emerging theaters of potential conflict for us. And one is in cyber. And, and I think that we haven't talked very much about that today, but it, it, it remains a very significant threat. Um, cyber attacks on all of our systems, at attacks on our important institutions and critical infrastructure are a significant challenge to everyone in the region, and that is, is being seen more and more often as a, a real theater of conflict. 
And the second one is in space. And we have become very reliant, all of us, on uh, space-based technologies and, and the potential for conflict in that theater um, is also very high. And to that end, in our most, my most recently uh, defense policy update, I brought forward significant new investments. We're going to establish a space council. We are investing in our space industries. We work very closely. I, I've been very fortunate as being a member of the NORAD um, a, a, a alliance with the United States. We're investing in, in for example, over the horizon radars and over the polar radar systems to, to increase on domain awareness. But we recognize that we're going to have to be strong in space and in every place where our interests could be threatened. Thank you very much. And uh, Minister of Defense of Thailand wanted one, one more thought to add. As on uh, Myanmar situation and situation with Cambodia, as on Myanmar, as you have asked, how can we help resolving the issues of a large number of Myanmar persons fleeing unrest. There's a mechanism that we have with Myanmar authority. We have the General Border Committee, not only responsible on border issue and help each other fixing problem, including the scam. The General Border Committee meeting is also provide safe area, humanitarian areas along the border. We should allow them to stay on our side as needed. If it is necessary, we will try to provide more and more shelter for the large number of people that might come across on the basis of humanitarian. As on the situation with Cambodia, on the issue of overlapping, we have been successful. And I would like this to set an example. We also have the General Border Committee This committee have openly discussed between each other. And we have a policy that we will change the area of awareness to become the area of peaceful coexistence. And we will help each other in demining, which is still the problem in the areas along the border, as well as promoting economy prosperity for the benefit of the people. There might be some emerging problems happen. The specific committee will be established to closely working together for peaceful resolution. This is quite a pleasant atmosphere and pleasant communication between Cambodia and Thailand. Three, perhaps four uh, quick notes. We're going to close at 11 o'clock exactly. We've got clocks up here. You've got watches. So let's see if we can do that. Jonathan Miller, first of Canada. Thank you, Sir John. Um, my question is for Minister Blair. Um, Minister, you spoke about Canada's support for the rules-based order and our initiatives under our new Indo-Pacific strategy, uh, and you also commented on your bilateral meeting with your Chinese counterpart and some of the positive outcomes of constructive dialogue. Yet the panel just before this, the Chinese Minister of Defense was vociferous in his criticism of Western support for the democratically elected government in Taiwan. Uh, can you comment on Canada's view, how Canada views its partnership with Taiwan and elaborate a little bit more about concerns about uh, the Taiwan Strait situation. Thank you. And from India, Darshana Bawa. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Dr. Chipman. Uh, two questions. First, to the minister from Thailand. Um, I'll keep it brief. I wanted to um, ask you about your views on if there is any serious consideration from the Thai government about developing the Krakenal, which could significantly reduce travel time 
between Indian Ocean and African countries uh, to Southeast Asia and beyond. Um, you're one of the few countries with a coastline both on the Indian Ocean and South Pacific in how you leverage the geography. Um, my second question is to Minister from New Zealand. Um, I had a different question for you, but you mentioned deep sea mining. Uh, it's, uh, I think Pacific is going to be a key theater for this. The ISS missed this deadline in deciding on the regulations and governance for it, and Pacific Islands are pretty divided on, on how to move forward on it. Uh, could you share your views on commercial extraction of minerals from the seabed and its implications on geopolitics and security? Thank you. Thank you very much. Virat Solanke. Thank you, Sir John. My question is for Ministers Collins and Blair. We heard a lot about your Pacific uh, Ocean strategy, but I'd be grateful to hear more about Canada and New Zealand's focus on the Indian Ocean. How much of a priority is the Indian Ocean for both of your countries, including relations with India? And could Canada and New Zealand seek to play a greater role in the sub-regional frameworks that uh, Minister Sutin mentioned, such as the Indian Ocean Rim Association and Indian Ocean Naval Symposium? Thank you. And from Indonesia, Andrea Saditya, Salim. Excellencies, thank you for the opportunity. Uh, first of all, highly appreciate this panel because of its tremendous attention to the ocean and maritime. As an Indonesian, I feel really connected to it. Uh, my question is uh, for Minister Collins and Minister Blair. Um, what is your strategic view on Antarctica and Arctic with the current global dynamics? Will there be spillovers to the polar regions? What are the strategies to prevent or to deal with that? Or Antarctica and Arctic are not relevant at all? Thank you. And final question, uh, now Mumu Paul from Myanmar. Hello. Um, my question is from uh, Minister of Defense from Thailand. Um, I understand you have answered a lot of, um, uh, answer many questions related to uh, Myanmar border issue. Um, and I also understand that uh, our Myanmar, given uh, that situation in Myanmar, places a significant burden on not only on the government of Thailand, but also the citizen of Thailand as well. So um, I would like to ask, and my question is additionally, that like uh, considering that some area are controlling by the other uh, the name and groups in, um, in there, how they can collaborate with the Thailand to support like a people in the safe place during a crisis. Thank you. Thank you very much. So, Minister of Defense of Thailand, if you could take one and a half minutes for that uh, specific question, and you each get uh, about two uh, to close at 11. Sir. As a uh, issue of Grad Canal that uh, you have asked the question, uh, Grad Canal might have a uh, quite a major affected. Therefore, we have a new project, the land bridge project, which we are currently conducting on feasibility study and planning of the land bridge project. As on the minority situation of Myanmar, we consider this as uh, internal affairs, but we do aware that the situation might be prolonged due to the complex of situation, but we have a very positive prospect that there might be a negotiation for peaceful dialogue. There is a proposal to have the general election, we do hope and we pray the general election proposal will be the best solution and will de-escalate the tension. It is my fervent hope. So deep sea mining. I'm just going to say basically is that so much conflict is about resources. So the potential for conflict in areas where there are enormous uh, mineral wealth that is coming out of the seabed, particularly in the nodules around uh, volcano, volcanoes, um, does actually create an issue which, as I say before, basically, if we consider the Pacific, it's, um, it's full of large ocean countries. 
And um, it is very important from my point of view that any wealth coming from that sort of activity needs to make its way to the countries who actually, um, who's, who, in whose economic zone it is. So I think that would be very important if there were to be any more of it. Uh, the Indian Ocean, um, obviously very relevant. It's um, in India in particular, we're trying to, and seeking to renew and to and grow, uh, grow and enhance our relationship with India. I mean, India is the world's largest democracy, incredibly vibrant and interesting part of the world, also uh, geopolitically very interesting with its placement in the world. Um, and I think we, we have plenty that we share with India, including um, rule of law, including uh, Westminster system, and, uh, and I think you know, we've got a lot that we want to do with India. Uh, Antarctica, can I just say, um, you know, some of the activity that, that's being talked about is going on might be some concern to us. New Zealand's been a long time uh, player in Antarctica. We've, um, we have very good scientific work going on there at Scott Base. It is very important to us that Antarctica does not become um, an area of mineral and wealth grab, that it is actually the Antarctic space that we've always known it to be. And um, we're very very aware that some countries might be thinking about getting more active and not in necessarily just a scientific way. Thank you, Bill. And, and, and John, first of all, the, the conversation I had with, uh, with Mr. Dong Jun, um, I tried to make it very clear that Canada embraced the One China policy, but our strong interest was stability and peace in the region. Uh, we talked about some of the passages that Canada has made through the Taiwan Strait, um, and our intent, I was made it clear, was defending the principle of freedom of navigation in international seas, and I also expressed concern that China's action in the immediate aftermath of Taiwan's democratic elections were, in my opinion, un unnecessarily provocative. Now, please be assured that Minister Deng Jun replied to me was as frank as it was this morning. Um, as, as well, um, one of the things I can also share with you is, is that the Arctic is, is, is actually, our Arctic is melting at four times the global rate, and, and, and therefore it's becoming far more accessible. What we've also seen is the aggressive and assertive actions of certain adversarial uh, nations that are challenging our sovereignty in the region, and it is one of the things that strongly motivates us to increase our pre presence there our strength in order to deter th those types of actions. And finally, let me also reiterate, India is very important to Canada. It's very important to the world. And, and we are actively working to engage uh, more appropriately uh, with uh, the, the Modi government. There have been some challenges for Canada in the most recent past, but we believe that the appropriate resolution of that is through dialogue um, and, and through proper engagement. It, it's, again, it's a very important trading partner to us. It's an important emerging economy. Um, and, and we believe that it's a, it's a non-aligned nation, and we have to um, appeal to its interests. Thank you very much indeed. Well, I think we've had an absolutely wonderful panel, and the IISS is committed to doing more work on all the subjects that have been addressed here. Please thank my panel, and uh, return at 11.30 exactly. <laughs>